Good morning. Welcome back to our class, John, that you may believe. Today is February 21st, and there's actually about 10 inches more snow today than there was last week when I complained about the snow, so I'm not going to say a thing about it today. But it is February 21st, and a couple of interesting things on this day, because it was on this date in 362 that Athanasius returns to Alexandria. Now, Athanasius is one of my particular heroes in the faith for a number of reasons. Uh, his nickname is, is Athanasius Contramundum, which is Latin for Athanasius against the world. This is a guy in church history that was excommunicated five times. He's excommunicated five times and gets it all taken care of, comes back into the church. He's, he's incredibly influential in a number of areas not the least of which is in terms of what we call the Nicene Creed. Now, this particular uh, time was his third exile, and it resulted in, from a fight that started with the, the emperor at the time, which was a guy named Constantius, who was the son of Constantine, who had taken the side of Arius. Arius was another bishop, another church leader at the time, whose beliefs led into what is called Arianism. Ar Arianism, not Arius, A-R-I-U-S, leads to Arianism, A-R-I-A-N-ism, Arianism. Now, that's not to be confused with Arianism, A-R-Y-A-N, which is the German belief in Nazis and all that, something completely different, nor is it to be confused with Arminianism, which is something based on a guy named Jacob Arminius, which comes a thousand years later. And who knows, maybe some point in the future we'll talk about Arminian or Arminius or Arminianism. But Arius believed that God uh, the Father was immutable, that he could not be changed. And as a result of that, Jesus could not be his son. And therefore, Jesus was a created being. So Jesus was the firstborn, but he was nonetheless a created being. Uh, the result uh, of this was this huge rift between Athanasius, who, who was very supportive of what we today would call Trinitarian theology, the idea that Jesus, the Father, the Spirit are three in one, as opposed to Arius and Arianism, who believed that Jesus was a created being. So this rift, uh, kind of, it was a, a burning controversy during the 4th century uh, and resulted, first of all, the first blow in favor of Trinitarianism, what we call Trinitarianism today, was the Nicene Creed in 325 AD from the Council of Nicaea. Uh, then it was uh, revised slightly in, in three, I believe it was 382 AD at the Council of Constantinople. So when we talk today about the Nicene Creed, it, it's actually the, the creed from the Council of Nicaea, Constantinople in, in 382, and it has to do with, you know, Jesus being of the same substance and all of that. So again, Athanasius, Athanasius Contramundum, that's my guy. In 1173, Pope Alexander III canonized Thomas Becket. Now, Thomas Becket had been the Archbishop of Canterbury, and now there's an interesting story here, because Henry II was the king at the time, and he had had uh, put Thomas Becket in place as the Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, Thomas and, and the king had been uh, essentially drinking buddies. And the king thought that putting Thomas into office would get an ally there and he would have a great time. But when Thomas became the Archbishop of Canterbury, he took it very seriously and became quite the penitent and quite the, the godly spiritual leader, which was not what Henry II wanted at all. And so, there is alleged at one point that Henry II said something to the effect of, would somebody rid me of this troublesome priest? Just talking to himself. And as a result of that, that, that statement, there were four knights who took it upon themselves to travel to Canterbury and ultimately murder Thomas Beckett. This is kind of interesting given today's current climate where you know it is alleged that a certain political leader said some things and other people acting upon those cause actions in certain places like I don't know the US Capitol okay kind of the same idea so was Henry II responsible for for Thomas Beckett's death well that's one of the great uh, controversies one of the great discussions of world and specifically British or British church history 
On this date, a little more recently, on this date in 1931, the Chicago White Sox and the New York Giants played the first exhibition night game. was played on this date in 1931. In 1970, the Jackson 5 made their their American Bandstand debut on this date. Now, they had been on TV prior to this, but this was their first time on American Bandstand. They played I Want You Back in ABC. You can check it out on YouTube. It's there. And uh, my wife can attest to you that it's always a bad thing when I get onto a Jackson 5 kick because then I'm walking around humming Jackson 5 songs for the next several days. In 1972, Richard Nixon met Mao Zedong in China. Uh, that great trip, Nixon going to China, that took place, the meeting took place on this day in 1972. In 1983, runner Donald Davis ran a mile in six minutes and seven seconds. Now that in and of itself in 1983 wouldn't be that big a deal. Run, not that I could ever run a mile, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying. But the thing about that is that Donald Davis ran the mile backwards. Why? I don't know. But he did it in six minutes and seven seconds. And finally, born on this date in 1794 was the famous uh, Mexican general, political leader, hero to uh, Mexicans everywhere, Santa Ana. Very uh, significant in the early uh, Mexican history, uh, U.S. history, Alamo, all that kind of stuff. He was born on this date in 1794. All right, well, that's all I've got as far as that goes. But there's a lot more to talk about when we get to 1 John chapter 2. So let's go there now and start talking about that passage. Good morning. Welcome back. We are here today talking about 1 John. Uh, today we're talking about, we're going to start talking about 1 John chapter 2. Actually, we're going to a couple of verses at the end of chapter 1. And we're going to go through uh, several verse, several, a couple of chapters at least. Uh, again, I want to reiterate that what I'm doing as far as 1 John is I'm just kind of tying together the Gospel of John with the Epistles of John. and Just sort of pointing out how the one builds on the other or vice versa. Okay, I, We talked last week about the possibility that the Epistles came before the Gospel. So that's kind of the focus I'm doing and I'm just kind of going through as, as quickly as I can not wanting to spend a lot of time. You can spend, you know, many, 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 many sessions going over John, uh, John's epistles in a verse by verse context if you want, and that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I'm just trying to get through it as quickly as I can looking at just these particular points. There's a lot of different themes you can go through. You can do a whole study of John and talk about John and the believer or John and light and darkness and these kind of things. So again, just talking about John and its relation to the gospel and how those two work together. So as we begin today, before we get into John chapter 1, the end of John chapter 1, I, I just want to start by reading, reading a passage from the gospel of John. And, and I'm going to be doing a lot of flipping back and forth uh, between the gospel. You know, I've got the gospel over here and I've got my epistle text over here. Uh, but I, I want to just start with reading a passage. Again, I'm reading from the NIV. Uh, the updated NIV uh, in John chapter 14. Again, if you remember, John chapter 14 is the beginning of Jesus' final discourse or the so-called upper room discourse where he's talking to the disciples and he's giving them the final instructions uh, as far as what's going to happen. And uh, so in John chapter 14, beginning with verse uh, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father and he will give another advocate to help you. And be with you forever the spirit of truth the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him for he lives with you and you he for he lives with you and will be in you uh, okay so just keep in mind that 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 statement as we talk about first john and the different texts uh, as we move in so last week we ended up at the end of verse 8 uh, chapter 1, verse 8, and said, the passage here, the, the three verses, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Okay, beginning, talking about verse 8, if we claim to be without sin. Now, 
the passage here is is talking about you know this idea of being without sin is talking about the the guilt that comes from sin or the state of sin okay and and what's interesting and and i think what was happening then is very similar to what's happening now isn't that we're doing things differently it, it's that and, and it's not that we're doing things differently it's just the way we view things are different okay so if we say if we claim to be without sin if we claim we're not in a state of sin we're not bad people so it, it kind of reminds me in in the early I think it was the early 1990s uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan who was a senator uh, and a significant person in, in various Republican administrations, the Nixon, Ford uh, administrations, had, uh, had, had written a, a, a thing for American Scholar Magazine called Defining Deviancy Down. Defining Deviancy Down. I believe this came out in the, in the early 90s, 92, 93, something like that. And, and the idea of defining deviancy down was talking about crime statistics and, and how people were, you know, cities were saying that their crime statistics are have improved. And his point wasn't that the actual acts have changed. We've just changed the way that we define them. So prior to, I don't know, I'm just picking an arbitrary date. So prior to 1980, a certain act would have been considered a crime. Let's just, let's just say for sake of discussion, breaking a window. Breaking a window in 1979 would have been considered a crime. So every time somebody broke a window in 1979, that was recorded as a crime. Well, after 1980, and again, the dates are completely arbitrary. In 1981, breaking a window was no longer considered a crime. So the same community in measuring their number of crimes in 1979, they had, let's just say they had no other, just for sake of discussion, they had no other crime. I mean, one robbery and five broken windows, okay? So they had one robbery in 1979 and five broken windows. So in 1979, they had six crimes, okay? Well, in 1981, by, by 1981, the, the, the idea of breaking a window as a crime had changed. That's no longer a crime, okay? So in 1981, they also had five broken windows and one robbery. But in terms of measuring crime, they'd only had one crime because breaking a window was no longer considered a crime. So they said, well, in 1979, we had six crimes. And in 1981, we had one crime. And so therefore, crime has gone down. Okay. Well, crime hadn't gone down. We have just defined deviancy down. And I think that's a lot uh, 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 this is a very, and again, Moynihan is not coming from a particularly uh, scriptural viewpoint, uh, but he's just looking at the statistics and saying, look, it, it isn't an actual change. It's just we've changed the way we count these things. And I think that this is kind of what's going on. Remember when we talked about it, it, the, the different, uh, this, this, this Gnostic idea that what we did in the body is irrelevant. Well, part of that is, is a lot of these sins that are against the body are no longer sins because the body is irrelevant. And so the number of sins has gone down. And, and so we've defined deviancy now. And, and I think what, what, Paul, what, what John is getting at here is this, if we claim to be without sin, if we're not in this sin state, if what we're doing is no longer a sin, is, is no longer considered a sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And those of us of a certain age, and by a certain age, I mean my age, okay? Um, we, we can look back and, and say, and see the change in the church, in, in the local church that we've been involved with. We can say that, listen, when I grew up, this particular activity was really, really frowned on in the church, okay? Whereas now in 2021, that particular activity not only is no longer frowned on, it's almost encouraged, okay? So uh, again, it, it, it's just one of these kind of deals. And, and John is saying, look, you know, if we, if we claim to be without sin, if we claim that we are not in this state of sin, we lie. We are just not, we just have missed the mark. And that is, again, that's what we talked about as being sin. However, there's a solution. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Again, talking about Jesus. He is faithful and just 
and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So there, there is a, a hope. It, so it's like you don't have to define deviancy down. You don't have to change your definition of what's right or wrong. There is forgiveness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. And I think maybe he's referring back because we, we talked about this, that by the time this epistle is written, it's very likely that Paul's epistles are out there for general uh, purposes. And again, Paul's epistle to the Romans, that great doctrinal treatise, one, you know, Romans is, is, is interesting amongst all of Paul's epistles in that Romans is like a, a particular treatise. It's, it's sort of like a single point kind of, okay, I'm going to make a point, I'm going to develop it, I'm going to argue it, and I'm going to be done with it. Whereas our others of Paul's epistles like Corinthians. Okay, let's talk about this. Now I'm going to talk about this. Now I'm going to talk about this. Whereas Romans is like single idea. I'm going to kind of, kind of you know, what does the gospel mean? Kind of, and again, someday we'll get to Romans later, a couple of years, years or so. Years or so. Um, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and the word is not in us. Now when we talk about confessing sins, it's interesting. If we confess our sins to God, what, you know, what does that mean? What does it mean to confess our sins to God. Now, when we confess a crime, if, you know, when, we, when we're watching the, the TV, the crime procedurals, and somebody confesses the crime, then what, what he or she is doing oftentimes is admitting that they did this particular act, okay? And, and oftentimes, it's a surprise. Somebody comes in, I want to confess to the crime of this, or I want to confess to the crime of that. Well, you know, when we when we talk about confessing the, our sins to God, it's like, well, are we telling God who we say is omniscient, all-knowing, all-powerful? Um, are we telling him anything he doesn't already know? Well, no. So what does it mean to confess? And I think the point getting into kind of the, the understanding of what the word means is, is when we confess to, to God— and when we confess, even, even in talking about interpersonal relationship, when we confess something, is, is, is we're agreeing with the person to whom we're confessing that what we did is a bad thing. Okay, We're agreeing with God that this, is the, uh, that, that this was a sin, that I did fall short of the mark. Okay, that I did miss the mark and I do need restitution or, 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 or reconciliation. I do need forgiveness for that kind of stuff. You know, maybe some of you ha have ever been, been, if you've ever been married and you have a discussion with your, your significant other and, and the discussion has to do with something you or, or, or your, your significant other did. Okay. And, and it's, you know, have you ever had this conversation where you say, yeah, I did that, but it's no big deal. Okay, so again, that's not a confession, okay? You're not agreeing that it's a significant event, that it's a significant act, okay? You, you haven't confessed that. You may have agreed that you did this, but now there's a difference of opinion as far as, okay, well, so what? I did that. So what? It's no big deal. Confession, confessing our sins to God is saying, yes, God, I did this, and it's a big deal. It has missed the mark, and I think that's what, what John is getting at here, Okay. If we can claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. And of course, this is one of the great verses. You know, verse verse nine: we confess our sins; he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the the King James. You know, that is one of the great great verses of Christian assurance um, that we can have fellowship with with God. Again, John is talking to believers. Talk, John is talking to believers that are at a crossroads that are dealing with these. These guys that are wandering off, okay, um, and, and people within the church. And how do you deal with all of this stuff that's coming out as time goes on? Okay, so it's a great, a great passage. Moving into chapter 2, John, there's a shift in tone here. John chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, he says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. Now, it, it could be that this is parenthetical. That you could put like parentheses around this, like listen, John. You remember, you remember in in the gospel, John was always doing these Johnisms, we called them, where John is just kind of on the side, going, "Listen, I'm just this is this is what this is." Okay, okay. Jesus said this so that or something, you know, all, all the time. And I think perhaps e even within the epistle, even though the epistle is like the ultimate Johnism, this is a Johnism of a Johnism. This is John going, "Listen, I'm writing this to you so that you're not going to sin." 
so that you will not sin, or maybe that you will understand the gravity of the, the actions that you do. But if anybody does sin, okay, which again, Paul's doctrine, Paul's teachings are out there, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God in Romans 3, uh, the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, you know. Um, but if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Now go back to that passage I, I read earlier from John chapter 14, where John, where P, G, I'm sorry, Jesus in in a in a way of comforting his disciples or saying, listen, I'm going to send another advocate, this this advocate, this paraclete, this legal uh, uh, kind of attorney, somebody who's going to stand alongside you and support you and be your advocate. I'm going to send another one. So Jesus was one, and then Jesus is going to send another one. And this is where we're talking about the Holy Spirit, this Trinitarian, this idea of the three in one here. So uh, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Okay, so again, he, he said, listen, Jesus is doing this. He is advocating for us. So John 14 talks about Jesus as being an advocate, being the Holy Spirit as being another advocate. And so we get an idea of the role of Christ currently, that Christ is an advocate for us currently, claiming our righteousness before God the Father. Here, uh, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world, okay? Go back to John chapter 1, verse 29. What does John the Baptist say the first time he sees Jesus? Look, the Lamb of God who takes away what? The sins of the world, okay? Again, here, this atoning sacrifice. Now, when we talked about John, we talked about the Passover, we talked about the sacrifice, we talked about what it meant. And, and basically, it was this, that the, the, the real, real, real fast version is, is that an offense had been done, sins had been committed, some, some offense needed a, uh, a payment, it, we needed to, to compensate the person wronged for that. And that compensation came in the form of sacrifice, that compensation came in the form of Usually through the Old Testament sacrificial system came through the sacrifice of a lamb, sacrifice of a, you know, goat, whatever kind of animal. And, and you know, we focus a lot on just the fact of the death of the animal. And that's important in the, you know, the blood of Jesus Christ and, and, and all that. that. That's important. But the sacrifice element isn't just that something died. It's that the persons offering the sacrifice gave something for that to happen. They, they gave some of their income or, you know, some of their, you know, this was one of their lamps that they could have sold. So so the, the person giving this sacrifice, they're, they're sacrificing something. They no longer have something that they used to have. Now, it, this involves the death of an animal, but it, there, there's a personal element to it that we, we kind of tend to figure, we tend to focus on, oh, okay, there's a dead animal. Like, yeah, there is a dead animal, but that dead animal was put there by somebody who sacrificed, gave money, gave of their income to put that animal particularly there. And here he is the atoning sacrifice. That is his sin. The death of Jesus atones, covers, pays for this, this sin that has, that has happened. Talking about this theology of what did Jesus' death mean? Well, he is the atoning sacrifice for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, if you're going to be doing a study on uh, salvation, soteriology, soteriology is, is the big theological word, meaning the doctrine of salvation. You know, you're going to look at this first. This is going to be one of the verses where Jesus' death is effective for all, or it's, it's sufficient, and I may have this wrong, that it's sufficient for all the deaths, that, that Jesus' death on the cross, his blood was such that had, did all the world wanted to become a believer, it would be enough, okay? And, and this would be a verse that would, would, would support that. Verse 3, we know, or I'm sorry, in verse 2, like the, the King James word is, you know, he is the propitiation. You know, that's a great, great old uh, word that's often used that, that, and I think the NIV trying to translate because propitiation is not a word that you kind of throw around in 2021, um, you know, the atoning sacrifice, his, his death covered it all, I think is, is another way to, to put that. 
So in beginning with verse 3, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, and here he's probably talking about God the Father, but does not do what he commands as a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Okay? Again, I, you know, I'm thought here, the Charles uh, Sheldon thing about, you know, what would Jesus do kind of thing, that we should live as Jesus lived. And the King James says, you should walk as Jesus walked. But again, this isn't a new thing. In John chapter 14, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Okay, remember that, that discussion we had about the if then, that, that, that keeping Jesus' commands is a natural outcome of, of, of love for him. Verse 7, Jesus, dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Now, there's some discussion about what John is talking about here as far as the old command. And I, and I think, you know, the old command is simply to obey, okay? From the beginning, again, going back to Genesis, just obey, do what, do what God has to say. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and, and in you. Because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Okay. Remember back in John 13, verse 34, Jesus is talking to the disciples and he says, A new command I give to you. And what was his new command? Remember back in John 13, what was his new command? In, in John 13 was to love each other as Jesus loved them. Okay. Now, John here in the, in the epistle does not delineate or explain what the new command is. But he gives an example of it. Okay. In the next few verses okay beginning with verse 9 anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there is nothing in him to make them stumble but anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness they do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them again you have this 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 contrast between light and darkness that's so common in John's epistle you know, being in the light is somebody, you know, Jesus said, you know, I am the light of the world. That being in the light, being a believer leads to this sort of activity. And if you're not in the light, then you are by definition in the darkness. And in the darkness, you don't know where you're going. You're running into things, uh, kind, kind of stuff. So, so here, what, what is it? What is, what is this example? Talking, this example that John gives to explain what he means by a new command. Well, hating a brother, loving a brother or sister. Again, loving each other as Jesus loved them. So I think I think John's new command is Jesus' new command. Jesus, you know, here, love, love the brothers. All right, verse 12, uh, we, have a, we have a shift. In verse 12, there's sort of a shift, and, and I'll just read the passage, verse 12 through 14. I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. Okay, in verse, th these verses are usually given, you know, John's purpose in, in writing. And I'm writing, and, and there, there are two major kind of decisions you have to look at when you're looking at this particular passage, okay? So, he talks about writing to three distinct groups, and he, he, he repeats each of them twice, okay? I'm writing you, dear children, I'm writing you, fathers, I'm writing you, young men, dear children, fathers, young men, okay? So, children, young men, fathers, okay? So, you, you have to ask yourself, or you come to a decision about who are those three groups, Okay? Are they three specific groups? Okay, so is there a small group for the children? Is there a children's ministry? Is there a small group for the young men? And is there a small group for the fathers? And is he talking to those three particular groups? Okay, that's possible. Okay, um, and I think it's, it's pretty obvious if you just think about it, that if you look at it that way, that excludes a large number of people, most notably women. Okay. Now, there could be girls in the children group, but young men and fathers, okay? 
where are the women in, in this particular group? Is John ignoring them? Well, if you believe that John is addressing three specific groups of people, then yes, he is. Okay. Uh, I don't necessarily think he's doing that. I just think he's, he's looking at it within the culture of his day and saying, okay, these are three general groups. You have the very young, the young, the parents. Okay. So in our, you know, in 21st century America, you know, he's talking to the kids, he's talking to the millennials and the Gen Z's, and he's talking to the baby boomers and the generation X. Okay. Um, perhaps. Okay. And, and he's just saying, this is why I'm writing to you. And, and this is, this is actually in praise. Okay. I'm writing to you, dear children, you know, your sins, because your sins have been forgiven. Um, because you've known him, you've overcome the evil one. You know, I have confidence in you. Okay. That you have come so far, you know, that you have accomplished this stuff. Okay. So again, I'm writing to you because there's so much potential in, in these three groups. And, and it's interesting that each of these three groups, there's potential in all of that, okay? Including the fathers, like Ma, okay? Uh, you know, people who are, perhaps people who are older, that, that you're into a senior citizen age group and you think, wow, what else can I do? Well, there's still a lot you can do. I'm writing to you fathers, okay? And, and there's other, you know, parents, these, you know, people um, who, who have this generational influence. You have children and grandchildren and that, that, you, can, that you can possibly influence. But I think another another point that you have to understand or you, you have to come to a decision on is the, the, the phrase because. So, and this gets into the Greek construction, but basically it can be read two ways. Okay, so each of the each of these times he, he uses six examples. I am writing to you so-and-so because, as the NIV translates it, of this. So I am writing to you, group, because, and I believe the I've, didn't write it down. I think the Greek word is hoti here, but, and of this, okay? Now, that word, because, could be translated so that, okay? Now, understand the difference that it makes, okay? I'm writing to you, dear children, so that your sins have been forgiven, so that your sins will be forgiven, okay? So, it, it's either, it's indicative, meaning, it, it's, that's the because, I'm writing to you this because of this, or it's, it's, it, it's it's futuristic or it's looking forward to saying I, i'm writing this so that your sins will be forgiven i'm writing this so that you will know him prove from the beginning okay now you can look at it either way um in, in either way would be acceptable within the textual tradition okay the problem with the because and, and that is that is the accepted Way. And again, the NIV translates it, and most of the manuscripts, I'm sorry, most of the contemporary translations translate this word because. So I'm writing you, dear children, because. I'm writing you, fathers, because. I'm writing you, young men, because. As opposed to so that. That's how most of the translations go with it, okay? The problem is in verse 15, 15 through 17, and that is the very famous, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Okay, this, this injunction not to be a part of the world. Okay, so... In verses 12 through 14, John is saying, I'm writing to you three groups of people, you, you three demographic groups, because you have accomplished this great thing. And then he turns around in the next three verses and says, okay, don't love the world, don't, you know. So wait a minute, you just said we're overcome all of this, and now, okay. It isn't an insurmountable thing, don't get me wrong. I mean, even if you say, if you have been, your sins have been forgiven, you have known him, there was from, you have overcome the evil one, Okay. These are, uh, the word of God lives in you. This is still a good injunction, okay? And, and I think that's true, that, that love not, and I've dropped down to verse 15, do not love the world or anything in the world, okay? How many times in John did we talk about the world, that cosmos, this world system, okay? Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Verse 16, you know, the Net Bible talks about the pride of life. Uh, the, the Net Bible, the, uh, you know, which is online, the Net, actually it's the New English translation, but it's the, on the Net, uh, translates that pride of life as being the, the arrogance produced by material possessions, which I think is a really cool way of, of 
looking at that. What is the pride of life? It's that arrogance produced by material possessions. It's like, wow, I'm kind of cardio. Hey, look at my car. Look at my house. Look at my stuff. Look at what I'm wearing. Look at how cool I am. I'm, I've, I've made it by the world's standards. And again, you know, we all know stories and people, are, you know, oh, I had it all and it didn't matter kind of, you know, um, you know, whoever dies with the most toys still dies kind of, you know. So, so again, it, it, it's this interesting uh, a, a command, this, this uh, injunction from, from John to these believers who, who are at this crossroads. Okay, these believers who are like, okay, it's been 30 years. We've got these people that are giving us these different ideas, and what, what should we do? And, and John is like, stay away from the, that, that world system. Okay, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And again, I know, we, you know, if you've been in the church for a while, you've heard sermons based on it, so I'm not going to spend any more time on this passage than, than I need to. You know, he's just pointing out, again, this is where... That sin that we've denied a few verses earlier comes from this lust of the flesh, this desire. I want that. I want that. I want that. I want more stuff. Okay. I want more stuff. If I had a better car, if I had a bigger house, if I had a nicer suit, you know, that's, that's going to make me, that's going to make me happy. You know, but John gives us this warning. And then in verse 18, he, he slips into, you know, a little bit of an ap apocalyptic, this end things. He says, dear children, again, your children this is the last hour so is it is it the end is it the end does, does john anticipate jesus coming back anytime well as a matter of fact he does and and so john could be talking about that he's because jesus is going to come back anytime that 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 parousia that return of christ is going to come in any moment or or i mean another possibility is john is looking at himself and he's going look i'm in my 80s i'm I'm not going to be around much longer, okay? You can't count on me here. It's the last hour, okay? And as you have heard, so whatever, John is saying, look, look, we're, you know, the, the time is short here. And, and for any of us, time is short. Whether we'd like to think about it or not, time is short, okay? Time is short. And he says, dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, again, looking at other passages that, you know, Joel and Daniel and some of the things that Paul has written, you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come. Okay, These Antichrists, these, these people that are talking another gospel other than what John did. I, I think it's Paul that said, you know, if anybody preaches another gospel other than what we have taught, avoid that person. Okay, But again, go back to what we talked about earlier with the different gospel variations that are coming up, the, the docetism and the Gnosticism and Corinthianism. Okay, these, these, these variations that are coming up, you know, these are Antichrist. This is how we know it is the last hour, okay? The, this, the number of variations on the gospel, these numbers of heresies that are coming up, that's just proof that it's the last hour. Okay. Now in verse 19, he, he talks here, here, I, you know, this, this passage is talked about quite a bit. And I think he's, he's looking at these, these guys that have gone out and, and are teaching this false gospel, whether it's Gnosticism or Docetism or any of these things. And, and he says, they went out from us, verse 19, they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained in us. Remember that John comes, see, remained that remaining in Jesus. And I think that's an interesting theme. You could go through John and just talk about that whole idea of remaining. And the word could also be translated reside, okay? Reside or, you know, living in you, that this, this lives in you, this understanding, okay? For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but they're going to show that none of them belong to us. I was reminded, remember, I, there was a book a few years ago talking about... Um, it was a dating book called something to the effect of um, he, he's just not that into you kind of thing, you know. And the, the point was teaching people in relationships to say, listen, despite any outward indications that this person is really uh, infatuated with you or likes you or even loves you, the fact is they're not really into you. And I think Jesus, and I think John here is just pointing out. Listen, they were part of us. They went to our church. They came to our potluck suppers. They, 
They were in our small groups, but you know, they were never really a part of us. And, and the fact we know they're not a part of us because they left us, they went out for us and started teaching another gospel. Okay. So, I mean, it's like, suppose you had a fan club where you, people are going to sit around and talk about how great the Chicago Cubs are. Okay. How great the Chicago Cubs are. And you guys get together every, every Monday night and you talk about how great the Chicago Cubs are. And then one day on social media, you see, you see the vice president of the club in a video for the New York Mets. You say, wait a minute. He was with us and he was saying these things. It's like, but here, there he is talking about the Mets. And it's like, you know, anyone from the Chicago area knows that you cannot simultaneously be a fan of the Chicago Cubs and the New York Mets. Okay. It does, does not, not happen. Okay. We are still bitter about 1969. Okay. So John is saying kind of the same thing. Listen, I know we thought that they were with us, but look at what they're doing now. They, they never were part of us kind of, kind of stuff. None of them belong to us. Again, and I think he's talking to, maybe he's maybe this is a sideways thing to, to those who have gone out. He's going, listen, guys, you, you're not what from us, but if you confess your sin, your faith, God is faithful and just to forgive your sins. Okay. But you, so so verse, verses 18 and 19 are kind of talking to those who have, have gone out, but now John brings it back to, to his readers. But you have an anointing from the Holy Spirit, and all you know the truth, okay? And you all know this. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Now, verse 22, who is the liar? This is interesting. It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. Remember what we talked about today is the day that Athanasius comes, comes back to Alexandria after fighting Arius, why was Athanasius so adamant about Jesus' deity? Well, problem part of me on this verse right here. Jesus is saying, look, Arius, he's a denier. He is a liar, okay? He does not have the truth in him. And fortunately for orthodoxy and all, you know, Athanasius ultimately carries the day. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has also, I'm sorry, whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Go back to talking about John. There is that inextricable link between the Father and the Son. John talk, Jesus talks about it in John, and John repeats the story over and over again. This, I am in the Father, I and the Father are one. This, this, this inextricable link that, that Jesus tries over and over again to explain to his disciples what that means. And the disciples never quite get it. And, and I don't fault them because it is kind of a you know an unusual concept. And 2,000 years later, we still have trouble grasping that or wrapping our heads around it. You can imagine, you know, there it's, you know, uh, it, it wasn't any easier. As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. Again, there's that remaining idea, okay? Um, oh, I wanted to make one other point here, uh, talking about verse 23. It says, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Okay, now there's an interesting textual question here about this particular verse. Okay, so there's two parts to verse 23. It says, no one who denies the Son has the Father. That's the first part. And then the second part is, whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Now, what's interesting is that that second half of the verse is not in some of the later texts. Now, this is completely the opposite of how most textual problems exist, okay? Uh, and that is that, it's, that something is not in the earlier text and seems to be added later, okay? So, for example, in Mark, the longer ending of Mark, the earlier texts don't have it. Later texts do. Later manuscripts, I should say, do. Whereas it's just the opposite here. So given the rules of textual criticism, that is that older is better. It's one of the main ideas that if it's in the older text, it's more likely to be accurate. That that it's it's included in most of your text. But sometimes you'll look at a text, sometimes you'll look at a, a Bible, and you'll see this in parentheses. Um, or you'll see it in italics. And, and if you're looking at depending on what version you're looking at. Sometimes if you see it in, in like brackets or if you see it in italics, that means it's added, okay? That, that, they, that the authors 
I should say the authors, the translators, the editors of the text of that, that particular version that you're looking at seem to think that it should be noted that this was added. Okay, just an interesting thought. I don't think it adds or detracts anything uh, to have it. As for you, see what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you will also remain in the Son, and this is what he has promised, eternal life. Okay, this is what he has promised us, eternal life. Okay, again, go back to John chapter 15, verse 7. I am the true vine, if you remain in me and I remain in you. Again, John bringing up these themes from the Gospel of John here, this idea of remaining, remaining, residing. Okay, that's all kind of important here. I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. Again, these, again, Jesus, you know, these people are at a crossroads. They're, they're dealing with these, these different errant beliefs that are, are affecting them because people are saying, oh, wait a minute, I got, I got, wait, maybe that's not quite right. You know, I don't think Jesus worked that way. And so they're, they've got this, these variant beliefs. But John says here in verse 26, I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. Okay. As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you, and you do not need anything to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things. Remember what John, Jesus says in John 14, when I go, the comforter will come, the advocate will come, and he will teach you all things. All right here. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, you, what? Remain in him. You remain in him. So again, remember we talked about one of the themes of John is, is assurance. And I think when you see this uh, remain idea, you can think about this assurance that you remain in him. You stay, you reside, you live there. You're not. It's not going anywhere. He lives in you. You live in him. Remain. This, this is one of the... Uh, confidences that, that we have. If you know that he is righteous, talking about Jesus, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. Okay, again, this is getting back to what Jesus said. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Okay, this, this whole idea of this having the love of God, having, having the Holy Spirit dwell within you results in these behaviors, results in this sort of action. Okay, and other texts will do that, but you know, there's there's other passages where, where we could talk about that. Okay, all right, um, I'm going to end there. Uh, some of you uh, may, we'll, we'll get back with chapter three, and and some of you may think, wait a minute, I thought you said you're going to finish this in two weeks. Yes, well, I was incorrect there, uh, as far as being able to finish this in in two weeks, but I'll we'll get to the end. I'm trying to get through this as quickly as I can. Um, but in John chapter 3, beginning with verse 1, we have kind of a subject switch, so this is a good time. So again, think about this idea of remaining, this idea that, that the message of God remains in you, okay? And, and I think that's a great comfort. It's a great assurance that we can have, one of the themes of the gospel or the epistle of John. Okay, next week we'll, we'll take it back up here in John chapter 3, and hopefully there'll be less snow on the ground than there is today. Who knows? We'll see. But uh, we'll talk to you again uh, next week, which I think is going to be uh, March 1st, now that I think about it. Or is it February 28th? I don't know. Uh, we'll see you in a week, and we'll talk to you then. Thanks.